Good evening, and I welcome you also. I don't know if it's my place to say this or not, Butch, but uh, if you're going to continue looking for subjects that you haven't spoken on much before, I think you should keep on doing it. Tonight, I think you preached better than you talked. You did very good. Luke uh, chapter 2, we'd like to look at Luke chapter 2, and I'd like to start at verse 41. And we're speaking again, as Butch did, about the Lord Jesus Christ. But at this time, he is of the age of 12. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintances. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass, that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, how is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Here we have the Lord Jesus Christ at the age of 12, and it's recorded here for us. And what is it we can learn when we look at this passage? Well, it tells us how to handle the word of God. Where did they find him? They found him in the temple with the doctors, hearing the word of God. Our brother just spoke about four different kinds of hearts. But the commonality to all those people and the different conditions of their hearts, it didn't really matter. The commonality was they all had ears to hear. It was necessary for them to hear the word of God. Just keeping your fingers there and over in Luke chapter 10, we had a passage that was read to us this morning. Now it came, Luke chapter 10, verse 38, now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about with much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art carried, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. What was that one thing needful? To hear the word of God. What was needful for those four hearts that our brother spoke about? To hear the word of God. And that's what we want to do tonight. That is our, 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 our emphasis tonight, is to handle the word of God by hearing it and asking questions and seeking for answers too. So with that in mind, we, we want to turn to a few passages. And the first passage is Hebrews chapter 9. 
Hebrews chapter 9. And I would emphasize and ask, if you're here tonight to hear the word of God, just as we read, Mary chose the good part. You've taken a right step if you're here to hear the word of God. Christ says she has chosen the good part. And if you're here to hear the word of God, you've taken the right step to hear the word of God. So Hebrews chapter 9 and as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. We often hear everybody says that it is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. It sounds like such a condemnation when it is spoken that way, but look carefully at the passage. What does the passage say? It says, and as or because it is appointed unto man once to die, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. That's the wondrous news of the gospel right there. Because you're appointed unto die once and then the judgment, the wonderful news is Christ did something about it. Now we want to go to John 19. John 19, and if you listen carefully to the word of God, you'll understand it is all about one topic. John 19, starting in verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, and I'm reading the first few verses for context that you understand that we're talking about Christ hanging on the cross just about to give up the ghost and die, so that you understand the context of the verses. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then he saith to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple, took her into his own house. After this, Jesus knowing that all things, read it again, after this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be filled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So you can see that the passages here are associated with death in Hebrews. There's a death here. And now we want to go over to Revelations chapter 21. Revelations chapter 21. Revelations chapter 21. The first six verses. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. Beautiful statement. And there shall be no more death. Neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable, and murderers, and hermongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, 
shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, brimstone, which is the second death. So we want to ask questions of the things that we have just read. In the first passage that we read, it is appointed on man once to die. Who made that appointment? And we want to look at the other passage where he says, it is finished. In the first passage, it is a death appointment. If you have a dental problem, you go to a dentist and you have a dentist appointment. If you're sick, you go to a doctor, you have a doctor appointment. If you need a legal situation dealt with, you make an appointment with a lawyer. So we're not unfamiliar with appointments. But this appointment, it is appointed on a man once to die. Who made that appointment? And we want to look at that. In the second portion that we read, John, where Christ said it is finished, we want to take that word out where he said all things were accomplished. And what we see there in John is an accomplished death. Christ accomplished a death. And in the third one, death is being handled totally by God, and it is death abolished. So if you want to remember those three passages, it is appointed, it is finished, it is done. Or a death appointment, a death accomplished, and death abolished. We want to look to see how that appointment of death came about. And so we want to go all the way back to Genesis, Genesis chapter 2. And being mindful, we, we, we are going to ask a couple of questions here. And as one of our purposes of handling the word of God, we do want to ask, ask questions of the things that we are reading of. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in that day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So they were put in the garden and God says, you eat of that tree and that day you shall surely die. In Genesis chapter 3, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said unto the women, woman, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall surely, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as gods knowing good and evil. I wanted to read the whole chapter, but I'm not too sure if we'd have enough time for that. What happens is God comes down in the garden after this, after they disobeyed God, and they had sinned. They had taken that tree and he judged the serpent, he judged the woman, and he judged the man. And then after that, he drove the man out of the garden. Now go over to chapter five. And then we'll ask some questions after reading this portion. This is the book of the generation of Adam. In the day that God created man in the likeness of God, made he him. Male and, field cre male and female created he them and blessed them and called their names Adam in the day when they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years and he begat sons and daughters and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. So the question is an obvious question. Can the word of God be trusted? 
We read, God said, in the day that you eat of that tree, what is going to happen? You're going to die. Adam didn't die, did he? Not that day. He lived 930 years. The servant comes along and questions God's word and says, you're not going to die, so who is right? Is God right? Is the serpent right? <laughs> Adam did not die that day. So that we have to ask that question. We can go all the way back to Hebrews also. It is appointed unto man once, once to die, and then the judgment. But we also read in Revelations, did you catch it? Those that are unbelieving, fearful, those who sin are going to be cast into the lake of fire. And what was that called? The second death. So we have to ask these questions and we need not be afraid to ask these questions. God is not afraid of us questioning his word because his word is truth. We just need to ask the questions. But if you've never asked those questions, then how can you learn what God is trying to teach you? So it is appointed on a man wants to die, and then the judgment, but we have to deal with a second death. And here in, in the garden, these three individuals, the serpent, the woman, and, and Adam sinned, and there was a judgment passed on them. In Hebrews, we, we read, it is pointed out to man once to die and then the judgment, but here we see judgment being passed onto them before he died. Right? So I don't know if any of you have siblings, brothers and sisters, and you've, you know, you got a little bit of ruckus, rowdy or whatever, and dad comes in, mom comes in. And have you ever heard that expression? Your mom or your dad comes in and says, what on earth are you doing? Have you ever heard that expression? What on earth is going on? That is so perfect to give us the answer. There's our answer. What on earth is going on? Well, our brother mentioned and read the passage from John 3, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And further on in that passage, Christ says, if I speak unto you of earthly things and you receive it not, how can I speak unto you of heavenly things? So we have to discern between earthly things and heavenly things here. So what kind of death did Adam die? I think the best commentary on that would be found in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and this is the Apostle Paul that speaks. Sorry. Some of you get there faster than I can, but we'll get there. Let's get there together. And you are the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you watched, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as other. Others, but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye saved. And the simple answer to, well, why didn't he die that day? Well, he did die. He didn't die a physical death. He died a spiritual death. That connection between God and mankind was broken and because of sin. For as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin and so death passed upon all men. So it was a spiritual death. 
that occurred that day. And then 900 and some odd years later came a physical death. And that's how we discern between the earthly and the spiritual. And our brother said, ye must be born again. When you're born in the flesh here, you're not born with a living spirit. You must be born again. And that being born again comes of God. So I hope that ha answers the question of the appointment of death. But now we want to move on to, I've got about four minutes to go through a lot of verses. We want to move on to an accomplished death. John 3 and 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but hath everlasting life. And then the verse after that is, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So it was an accomplished death. God sent Christ into the world to accomplish a death for us. Over in Philippians chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you which was raised in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, and when was Christ in the form of God? We have a heavenly scene here. He's in the form of God. He's in heaven. Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. He took upon himself that form of a servant before he was sent to earth. He said to God, I'll do it. I'll be your servant. And because he took on that form of a servant, we go down to the earthly realm and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He was sent to this earth by God, his father. He came willingly. He even said it, he declared it in the Old Testament and in, uh, he reiterated it, it is reiterated in the New Testament, behold, I come to do thy will, O God. In the volume of the book, it is written of me. It was an accomplished death. Matthew chapter 20. Three times, three times we can read in the New Testament, but we'll just read the one passage, Matthew chapter 20, 17 and 19. And Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the 12 disciples apart in the way and said unto them, behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall reign, shall rise again. Three times in Matthew, in Mark, and Luke, he, does, he says the same thing. God gives us a record of three times, so we won't miss it. It is an accomplished death. Christ accomplished a death. He knew he was going to die. He told his disciples how he was going to die, how he was going to suffer persecution. So we can see that it is an accomplished death. 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul says, For I have delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ Jesus Oh, sorry, how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Paul tells us there that it was an accomplished death. 1 Timothy 1.15. 1 this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. So we can see that we have an appointment with death. And because we have an appointment with death, God has done something for us because we don't want to go to that appointment unprepared. And what he has done is he has accomplished that death for you through his son, Jesus Christ, an accomplished death. And the last one, because it is appointed unto man 
and then the judgment. The Bible speaks much of, of judgment. We can find that in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or bad, or whether it be evil. We can also see it in the last chapter of Daniel. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of the people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to the same time, and that in and that at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to everlasting contempt. And as the last passage, we want to look at chapter 20 of Revelations. Revelations chapter 20. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of these things, which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead, which were in it, and death and hell were delivered up, the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Again, we hear this term again, this is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And so there we have the gospel in its simplicity. Men have an appointment with death death and then the judgment what happens after physical death in that unseen realm it's judgment are you ready for that can you go into that unseen realm in your sins because if you do that second death it's not a physical death you've already died it's a spiritual of spiritual death a total, total, everlasting, everlasting separation from God. There's no chance. There's no chance after you reach that stage. You need seriously to do as our brother said, have ears to hear what God says, whatever condition your heart is in. Just come to God. He is so gracious that he sent his only son to die on the cross to accomplish a death for you so that you wouldn't have to die that way everlasting. He gives you everlasting life through what Christ did on the cross.